Our speaker tonight is, of course, Professor Monica Serino, who is a professor of classics and chair of the Department of Languages, Cultures, and Literature at the University of New Mexico. Her academic research centers on the reception of the ancient world on screen and the erotic in ancient Greek poetry. She has written several books, uh, her most recent being Screening Love and War in Troy, Fall of a City, which was published this year and has over 50 published articles and book chapters and is the recipient of recipient of several university and academic awards. We are honored to have her here with us as she considers how cinematic interpretations of the Homeric poems have inspired filmmakers to use epic themes and images in recent films and also how films adapt these epic poems. Uh, so, Professor Serino, it is my pleasure to turn over the room to you. Thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Well, thank you, James, so much, and uh, thank you to Kathy Blance for the um, for the um, invitation. Let me see if I can do the share screen thing, and uh, if that uh, looks pretty good, uh, James, just uh, let Looking me know. Looking great. That's fine. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, this is my uh, new uh, filmy background. So, hopefully, that uh, looks good uh, for all of you there. Um, so what I want to talk about today um, is the way that uh, filmmakers have used um, the Greek epics, that is specifically the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and a lot of associated sort of mythological and epic material that gets handed down to us um, uh, from uh, the ancient Greek world, uh, some of it filtered through the Romans, of course, uh, and talk about something that we call classical reception. So I'm going to put some some text on the screen here. And I promise you this will be the most text that you will see. Um, but I thought it would be important to first, you know, as we do, um, define the process of what, what we talk about when we talk about classics. We know we're talking about the ancient Mediterranean world, um, which is a, a term actually that people are using a lot more often now, ancient Mediterranean studies, as opposed to just classics, because that sounds kind of old fashioned, um, uh, although I like it. Uh, but so when we talk about classical reception, what do we mean exactly? So classical reception is how the modern world recreates the ancient world, whether it's history or myth or literature or, you know, archaeological finds or whatever, um, how those things are recreated in modern, uh, in modern media. And that can take a lot of different forms in terms of novels like Madeline Miller's novels that, uh, that you're uh, reading this fall and celebrating this week, um, uh, the novel Circe for, uh, in particular. So novels, uh, films, television shows, video games. Some of our, our colleagues work on video games um, and all sorts of media, uh, cartoons, graphic novels, uh, opera, uh, stage plays, um, et cetera. So some of us, uh, all of us who work in classical reception try to work as broadly as possible um, on these different uh, media. I work uh, mainly on uh, film and mostly on television lately. So I have a, a little bit to talk about about a new television show um, uh, that recreates the ancient world, uh, the ancient uh, Homeric world uh, for you all at the end of today's uh, talk. So the process of on-screen classical reception, um, what we're focusing on today specifically will be how the ancient Greek epic narrative um, themes and characters from specifically the Iliad and the Odyssey are adapted in modern popular screen um, entertainment, uh, both TV and film. And so when we're talking about uh, those cinematic or televisual, uh, televisual, that's a fancy word they use over in the media department, and I stole it. Uh, when we talk about cinematic or televisual, televisual interpretations of the Homeric poems, we can see that this goes back, um, you know, to the very beginning of, of cinema when it was first invented in the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and it's inspired filmmakers to use uh, those themes and images in many, many uh, films um, that are a lot more recent. So, you know, since the 1950s, I'm going to show you a few, you know, a few of those examples. But today I was going to sort of focus mostly on the more recent film, um, films and TV series, uh, such as Wolfgang Peterson's Troy, Clint Eastwood's uh, Western Unforgiven, um, and uh, a few others that are focused on the Iliad, 
Uh, we'll also take a look at the Odyssey miniseries from 1997. Uh, one of my favorite movies, the Coen Brothers, Oh Brother, Where Art, Art Thou, which is also based on the episodic nature of Homer's Odyssey. Um, and uh, more recently than David Farr's uh, Netflix uh, television show, uh, Troy Fall of a City. Um, now, when we look at these um, films and the one TV show that I'm going to uh, mention, there are two different ways that these can be, uh, that these can present the Iliad and the Odyssey. We talk about these adaptations then in sort of a split level uh, sort of formulation. And that is some of the films and television shows like Troy Fall of a City attempt, <laughs> some more successfully than others, attempt to tell the story uh, set in uh, the same ancient context or what you know the modern de set designers think uh, is the ancient context. So the Troy film from 2004, as you see in the top corner there with Brad Pitt as Achilles, you know, set in the ancient world. In the other corner, we have the um, uh, the poster from the Odyssey miniseries, which was set in the ancient world, right? So those are, uh, that's one way that adaptations um, can take uh, take shape. And we call this the more, the sort of the more overt uh, adaptation style. Then we have what is sometimes called the more elusive or sometimes subterranean um, uh, adaptation mode, which is where those themes and images and characters and plots, for example, from the ancient epic are used again in different settings, different environments, uh, sometimes still historical, like the Western environment or in O oh Brother Where Art Thou, we've got the early uh, 20th century um, uh, in the, set in the Old South. So those are two different ways uh, that we are gonna talk about uh, the adaptations today. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that um, we have that sort of split level model um, in our minds when we're talking about the different ways that these adaptations can happen. Uh, James very kindly referred to uh, some of my uh, publications. Um, one of the ones that is uh, that might be, you know, apropos for you all, as I know, avid readers and library patrons, um, is a volume that I edited a few years ago um, with my colleague Meredith Safran from Trinity, another local university. Um, and uh, this is called Classical Myth on Screen. And uh, in, this, um, in this volume, we, we went to some length to sort out the difference between, you know, the ancient mythological uh, setting and the sort of more um, subterranean or elusive strain of, of uh, adaptation. And so we have, um, in our introduction, we talk about um, these two different types of adaptations where mythic narratives can be widely adapted and appropriated both in projects that advertise their debt to classical antiquity, like the movie Troy set it set in the ancient world, or those whose engagement is more subterranean or selective, um, yet still very powerful. So we're going to look at both of those uh, today or some examples of both of those, those depending on how, how our time goes. Um, but just so you know, if you are interested in looking up this uh, volume, um, I know that this is a, um, a, oops, a literate crowd. So let me get that up there. This is Palgrave uh, Macmillan uh, from 2015, this particular um, volume uh, with the, the beautiful warrior on the front. Okay, so um, another thing I wanted to th uh, throw out here to you all, um, again, because I know that you guys are all readers and you are looking as well at Madeline Miller's books. Um, uh, this week or this whole this whole last few weeks uh, to prepare for for her talk on Thursday. I just wanted to point out as a as a locally trained uh, classicist, um, as a Yale trained classicist, um, I do have my own recommendations for uh, which are uh, my favorite uh, translations, verse translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I wanted to point out um, uh, both of these uh, translated by uh, Stanley Lombardo in absolutely gorgeous edition. Uh, published by Hackett Publishing Company. Um, Stanley Lombardo, himself a poet, and uh, does an absolutely exquisite job of translating um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and these are the, the these are the translations I order for my classes when I teach large, you know, lecture classes on 
um, on, on the epic or on um, uh, classical uh, reception of the epics uh, in my course called Homer in Hollywood. Uh, these are, the, um, these are the, the books, these are the versions, these are the translations that I order so uh, for the class. They're absolutely gorgeous and I highly recommend them. Let me also point out that Hackett uh, in its uh, sort of more business, uh, business mode has also published um, sort of selections, I guess you would call them a, a kind of a selection uh, uh, from, the, um, from the Iliad and the Odyssey in one volume um, and, and then also what they call the essential Odyssey and the essential uh, um, Iliad you know, sort of like, I guess you would refer to them as abridged versions, um, but they are still the Lombardo translations. They focus on specific passages. So you don't have to, you know, slog through the whole thing. I mean, it's called an epic because they're long. Um, and I have, I confess, ordered these sometimes for my students as well, when I, you know, think it's kind of, you know, going to be too much for them to read uh, the whole thing. These are very useful. And again, these are, are fun to have uh, for your beach reading or on the plane or something, um, if you like. Like as well. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as a uh, suggestion for you um, uh, uh, for your reading. Okay, so the first film I want to talk about, um, oh sorry, I, I was going to put a whole list of the films here for you um, uh, with, their, um, uh, with their dates and their, um, and their uh, uh, not editors, what are they called, their directors. Um, and uh, just so you know what we are looking at. So with Troy, uh, the film in, uh, from 2004, directed by Wolfgang, Wolfgang Peterson, um, uh, you know, I favor the director's cut. It's about a half an hour longer, uh, has a lot more stuff in it, obviously. Um, this one, you know, replays all the time. It's on Netflix. It's on, it's on, it's even on like regular TV uh, all the time. Um, the Odyssey miniseries from 1997, there was a little renaissance of miniseries. Some of us can remember when miniseries as a format started back in the 70s uh, with I, Claudius and the Thornbirds and, and those kinds of things. And then that sort of got, you know, went out of fashion for uh, a couple of decades and then was sort of resurrected at the end of the 90s. Um, and there were uh, several different classically themed uh, miniseries, that is two or three or four part um, uh, series, what are called today limited series. But remember, we used to call those miniseries. Um, the Odyssey was one of those, which was directed by Andrei Konchalovsky. I will talk about that in a few minutes. So Troy and the Odyssey miniseries are the ones that are overt, or uh, if you want to call them set in the uh, ancient world, that is, you know, uh, that's the, the creators of it, um, you know, designed an ancient world for these films to be set in. Now, the other films that are more, again, selective or subterranean, um, again, we haven't really decided on a nomenclature for these, but the ones that sort of utilize themes and tropes, um, uh, I'm going to talk about the film Unforgiven, uh, the Oscar winning film by Clint Eastwood from 1992, uh, the film, the Coen Brothers film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou from the year 2000. Um, I will mention Blade Runner uh, uh, briefly, uh, just because uh, it causes just a lot of emotions in people. My students despise this movie, but I'll mention it uh, briefly when we get to it as uh, evoking some, some epic uh, resonances. Um, a recent film, Mad Max Fury Road, which you might not think, you might not think you want to see, um, but is absolutely, uh, absolutely, you know, fascinating in its evocation of some Homeric themes. Then I will talk a little bit about Troy Fall of a City, which is a brand new series um, set in the ancient world, utilizing mostly uh, Homeric material, but also some tragic material um, uh, created by David Farr, the associate director of the Royal Shakespeare Company in the UK, a uh, very uh, dramatically minded uh, creator. I highly recommend um, that you go home right away and put this in your Netflix queue. Uh, the first film I wanna talk about is is uh, uh, Wolfgang Peterson's Troy uh, from 2004. There's the poster uh, from the, um, uh, the director's cut. And again, because I know that you are a reading crowd, let me just mention a volume of essays published by my colleague, uh, 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 Martin Winkler from George Mason University um, uh, uh, from Blackwell, 
um, I forget the year now, 2007. Yes, Blackwell 2007. Uh, again, if you're interested in the movie Troy, this is a very interesting um, collection of essays talking about, uh, you know, uh, talking about the reception of uh, Homeric material as presented um, in this film. So um, this is the first one that I want to talk about um, in terms of how this film, the director's cut, again, with about half an hour more footage than the theatrical release. Um, there were some extended battle scenes, uh, some extended uh, love, you know, love scenes as well. Um, an entirely different musical score uh, for those of you interested in that kind of thing. Um, but uh, uh, that's the, the one that I like to focus on. And when we talk about uh, classical reception or an epic adaptation, what do we mean, right? What do we mean when we say, is there, you know, what kind of an adaptation is this? How does this movie recreate the Iliadic material? Well, first and foremost, as I tell my students, the first thing is, um, it's even more, more uh, initial than this, and that is just that it is an entertainment designed to make money, all right? So they have no obligation, uh, no artist has any obligation to the ancient material, uh, to uh, classical uh, classics professors like me, um, to novelists, to film professors, to, you know, to, to, to no one do they have obligations. They just need to make money. They have an obligation to the studio or to the producers who are financing their, their uh, property. Um, however, as uh, students of classical reception, uh, of which, uh, uh, among which I count myself, and hopefully you all do as well, um, what are some of the things that we're interested in talking about when we talk about a movie like Troy? Well, we want to talk about uh, the feeling of history. If it's going to be set in the ancient world, how does it do that, right? How does it advertise its, um, its, its debt to the ancient world, right? They often hire historical consultants. I've done it myself on, on films and television shows. Um, they, want to, uh, they want to sort of boast about this connection um, with the, the ancient world, and they want to impart a feeling of history um, into, their, into their film or television show, in this case, the film Troy. Um, what about the sense of sweep, right? Our word epic uh, denotes this idea of size or importance or scope, right? And so the camera itself in a movie like Troy can, um, can emphasize this feeling of, of, you know, of epicness, right? Of its, um, of its uh, relation to the epic poems uh, in how it presents the film uh, visually on screen. The characters, of course, are incredibly important. And I'll talk about a Achilles uh, in a minute, uh, specifically, how are the heroes portrayed, right? Um, which heroes make it into the movie and which ones don't, right? One of the uh, criticisms we have of the movie Troy is that several of the characters, especially the female characters, are um, combined, right? Some are just cut out and some are just squashed together where you get these composite characters instead of fully, you know, realized the way they are in the Homeric uh, uh, poems and, and the dramatic poems and the myths. So how are are the heroes uh, portrayed, and then what does it mean uh, to um, what does it mean to the audience that that is watching the film, right? Uh, uh, and there are different audiences. There are more educated audiences. There are less educated audiences. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Um, does that, uh, you know, does the audience that knows uh, classical history get all, you know, the, the audience that are more, the audience members that are more familiar with, um, with Homer, do they get, you know, do they, you know, enjoy the film more? Are they supposed to enjoy the film more? Well, obviously filmmakers are just trying to sell as many tickets as possible. Um, and so they want to capture audiences in the way that other films have done, right? Filmmakers um, basically like to copy other uh, filmmakers. And if a film does well, uh, in this case, the, the movie Gladiator that came out in 2000, you know, sort of spawned a renaissance of a number of ancient world themed films from, you know, about 2000 to about 2010. Uh, and Troy was included in that. They wanted to capitalize on that huge uh, commercial and, and critical success of Gladiator. And so they wanted to have similar, you know, similar things in the film while still being, uh, 
faithful as much as they could to the Homeric epic poems. So sometimes they're faithful and sometimes they're not, uh, depending on uh, on the you know the scene or the the part of the film. And of course, some of it gets cut uh, um, in the editing room floor. Uh, Brad Pitt as Achilles there, as you can see, one of his more uh, signal lines from the film, Immortality, Take It, It's Yours, as they land on the beach in uh, in Baja, California, not uh, ancient Greece, not even Turkey or Malta, where a lot of these, uh, or South Africa, where some of these uh, uh, ancient world films are shot. This was shot in Baja, California, um, where apparently they had to move a whole bunch of nesting turtles uh, before they could actually uh, shoot the scenes um, uh, in this film, but that's just a little film gossip for you. So what about Achilles in particular, um, the character of Achilles? Um, and as I tell my students, you know, it's important not to criticize a movie like, ah, how can that be Achilles? You know, this is what Homer says, you know, well, I mean, we can criticize a, a film, but we have to say to ourselves, why were certain elements emphasized? Why were certain elements downplayed? You know, what, what was in the mind of the filmmakers um, and of course, it takes hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people uh, to make a film. So it's not just the director, although um, directors do have a lot of, you know, a lot of say in the design and, and ultimate product of a film. But how does, a, how does an actor interpret a character, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many things that go into a film, but we have to ask what you know, visual purpose, what cinematic purpose um, do certain changes or certain emphases or certain things that are downplayed, you know, why were they there? What, what purpose do they serve? So when we look at the way the character of Achilles is portrayed, um, you know, I think quite well uh, by the actor Brad Pitt in the, you know, at the height of his, you know, sort of physical, uh, um, you know, beauty and masculinity. Uh, I'm, I'm told by some insiders that the, that the training staff, that is the physical trainers for Brad Pitt was one of the largest expenses on this film. So it's kind of funny to think about it that way, but you can see the outcome uh, for yourself. Um, he fights for his future glory, right, and his immortality. This is kind of a, an interesting thing for those of us who read uh, Homer, because obviously that is the most important thing to the Achilles of the, of the epic as well. And so the way it is highlighted in the film, um, you know, does a really good job in, uh, in uh, making this echo uh, with the Homeric uh, poems. Um, his style of fighting, right, uh, which is, uh, again, emphasized by Homer, uh, where, you know, he has this sort of running and, you know, sort of running and killing style. Uh, um, and of course, he is the greatest warrior that ever lived. There is nobody that's better than, than Achilles. If you fight Achilles, you will gain glory, but you will die. It is, there's just nobody who can beat Achilles in a fair fight. That is just part of the Homeric uh, part of the epic, uh, um, uh, you know, material that comes down to us. Um, the only way Achilles can die is through subterfuge. And so the, the story about, um, you know, being shot by an arrow uh, into his heel and so forth. So um, his style of fighting very well represented in the movie Troy um, with uh, 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 Brad Pitt doing this running and killing kind of uh, thing uh, throughout the film. Um, the, uh, his uh, men, his, his group of his sort of tribe of fighters that he comes with uh, to Troy from Greece, from Northern Greece, um, the Myrmidons, uh, you know, again, well represented in the film, uh, just as in the epic. I can see that I'm taking too much time, so I better hurry up. Um, he's conscious of his mortality and his destiny. Uh, the the uh, the actors presented the characters presented that way uh, by the actor in the film, and he also just like in the epic uh, knows that human life is both bitter and sweet, and uh, uh, repeats uh, numerous lines. Um, uh, the writer of the film, um, uh, um, uh, uh, David uh, Benioff. Uh, uh, involved in the Game of Thrones uh, franchise as well, um, uh, very, very well, uh, knew, knew his epic, uh, knew his Homer very well and uses a lot of lines that come directly out of uh, the epic poem. Um, a couple of other things that are uh, focused, uh, that are major emphases um, in the film um, that, uh, that are good to uh, emphasize here. Um, they do add some backstory elements right in the film, uh, particularly about Odysseus and so forth. And again, in the director's cut, you'll see more of those which were cut uh, before the theatrical release because the film was already quite a bit too long. 
Um, uh, there are a few plot changes. I don't know if I should give them away here. I know how people feel about spoilers, um, but there are some people um, who uh, die at Troy who don't uh, die at Troy in the ancient material. I don't think this would have bothered the ancients too much um, uh, because they were always uh, adapting their mythological, legendary and epic material themselves. Um, but this did bother a lot of purists uh, when they uh, followed uh, the, the Peterson film from 2004. Um, the role of Briseis uh, as a lover uh, for uh, Achilles is, uh, I don't know if you want to call it upgraded. Uh, she is a composite character combined with some other uh, mythological females uh, from the epic material. Um, uh, as you know, uh, from your film studies, uh, you have to have a central heterosexual romance uh, in, you know, 99% of the movies uh, have that. And this movie is no different. So Briseis and her romantic uh, affiliation with Achilles is emphasized in the film. Again, some people, um, you know, think too much, but that is, I think, a product of modern filmmaking. Um, a major turning point in the film, the death of Patroclus, uh, not giving it away too much, um, and is, uh, is uh, emphasized just as in the Iliad itself. And so they do a good job of that. Um, and Achilles uh, uh, death it itself. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is an extended fall of Troy scene, uh, battle scene in the um, in the movie, which of course does not happen in Homer's Iliad, uh, Homer's Iliad ends with the funeral of Hector after Achilles kills him in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Um, but we have this material that comes down to us uh, in what is called the epic cycle, uh, written by uh, most likely poets uh, later uh, than uh, 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 the Homer that wrote uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, we do have that material from the epic cycle as well as from several Greek tragedies, um, uh, uh, Athenian tragedies. So the fall of Troy scene is extended in the film. Um, um, and there's a very romanticized death, uh, or actually it's romanticized and romantic death of Achilles, focusing on the character of Briseis, again, highlighting the heterosexual romance, which is something that happens in a lot of feature films, uh, in almost all feature films uh, that we see. Just a few more, because I'm already uh, behind uh, time here, just a few more films I wanted to point out to you, uh, films in one mini series uh, that are, um, that, you know, take, uh, you know, take the Iliadic world as their setting. Uh, one would be uh, Robert Wise's uh, Helen of Troy from 1956. Uh, still a really fun watch if you're interested in it. Um, the Italian film with Steve Reeves uh, uh, called The Trojan Horse uh, in its English uh, 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 translation in, from 1961. The title's translated as The Trojan Horse. Um, and then another mini series from 2003 uh, called Helen of Troy. Um, not terrific uh, uh, from the USA Network. Uh, you can still find this on a couple of the streaming services if you're interested in it. Um, I've shown it to my students. They don't really like it very much. Um, uh, the Helen is a little uh, not the best character in the world, but you might enjoy it. So, all right. So moving on um, quickly to the, um, the film uh, Unforgiven from 1992, uh, Oscar winner for best picture that year, um, a meta Western, right? That sort of deconstructs the genre of, you know, the, the 1950s and 60s kind of shoot 'em up Western that was so popular uh, in the mid century. Um, there is a reading that, um, uh, you know, you might be interested in, and of course, uh, all of this is available, um, you know, I can, I'm happy to, to send you guys these sources um, at any point, um, but uh, the movie Unforgiven has many, many plot parallels uh, to the Iliad. Um, uh, the writer, David Peoples, seems to have uh, made some conscious echoes uh, in this film, um, not only, you know, sort of visual and narrative echoes, but some very um, uh, specific uh, uh, po uh, points of, of comparison um, uh, with uh, the Iliad. Um, and uh, there's this wonderful article by my colleagues, Mary Whitlock Blundell and Kirk uh, Ormond uh, uh, in the uh, journal Poetics Today. Uh, do I have a, a date there? Um, I think so. Come on. Yeah, from 1997. So if you want to look that up, uh, you can. So in the um, 
uh, in the uh, uh, Western, in the American Western, we have um, a glamorous, a glamorization of violence, right? And this, like I said, has started, you know, way back to when Clint Eastwood was a lot younger, right? In the 50s and the 60s, um, this whole sort of mode of showing um, the Wild West as a sort of glamorized fiction of the American foundational myth, right? Go West, young man, you know, to found, you know, to, to, to found these new states and these new, uh, you know, civilized, you know, putting civilization on the wild, wild west and so forth. Um, this is analogous to the glamorizing fiction that is the Homeric epic, right? That was also probably a horrific war if it was a real war, the Trojan War. But the Homeric epic sort of glamorizes it with these, with these heroes, with these, you know, larger than life uh, demigods, you know, like Achilles, um, these beautiful, you know, uh, people like Achilles and Helen and so forth all glamorized into this mythological framework. And the wild, uh, the wild, wild west, right? The Western movie also does that um, uh, as well and continues to do that every year. There are more and more Westerns. Uh, um, uh, just put a suggestion here, Quentin Tarantino's uh, recent film, um, but we see this on, um, on television as well, on Netflix, on the streaming services and various films, uh, feature films that come out. The character of William uh, Money uh, uh, in the film uh, is a supreme uh, warrior killer, right? <laughs> who leaves the uh, battle. He, he wants to retire just like Achilles, but he is drawn back into battle um, uh, after the death of his best friend. Uh, but this outlaw warrior um, uh, killer figure uh, uh, played by Clint Eastwood in the film uh, is analogous uh, and uses the figure of Achilles in the in the epic uh, to draw his character out. Um, and of course, the ideology of manhood that is that is sort of presented in the Western movie genre, um, you know, is iconically, iconically portrayed um, by um, uh, by Clint Eastwood and has been uh, for many years. So when we see him uh, in this film, Unforgiven, uh, evoking not only Homeric epic, but evoking his own past as a you know, as a, um, uh, as a, as a Western uh, icon, um, as an icon of Western films, we've got like, you know, both of these layers there going on uh, with this character of William Money. And so if you were to look at exact plot parallels, and again, those of you who've read the Iliad will, you know, and, and you know, and or seen the movie Troy or, or some of these other uh, films will be able to recognize um, these plot points uh, that we, um, that we can, uh, that we can point to. So in the film, uh, just like in the Iliad, uh, the warrior, in this case, the main character, um, William Money, rejects uh, the code of fighting. He doesn't want to fight anymore. And so part of the story is this, um, this weight, this sort of um, this sort of expectation that the warrior is going to re-enter the battle at some point, like Achilles does and as William Money does as well. Um, and when his best male friend uh, is killed, in the case of the movie Unforgiven, that's uh, Ned Logan, played by Morgan Freeman. Uh, when he is killed, uh, the main character, the main warrior, uh, is, is filled with rage like Achilles and re-enters uh, the battle uh, to get revenge for the death of his best uh, friend. And so I just said that, that he's filled with rage and he comes back into the battle um, and he achieves his vengeance with a great deal of brutality. This movie is not for the faint of heart. Unforgiven uh, is incredibly violent um, and um, is incredibly, uh, uh, you know, brutal in its uh, portrayal of uh, William Money getting his uh, revenge on um, uh, uh, sh on Sheriff. Uh, um, uh, Little Bill, played by um, uh, Gene Hackman. And then, just like in uh, the Iliad, the warrior is reintegrated into society. Um, of course, in the Iliad, uh, uh, Achilles uh, dies uh, in the epic cycle, but the other epic heroes are reintegrated into society, um, and so is uh, William Money at the end of this uh, film. Um, uh, when you are looking at other films that evoke uh, evoke Iliadic um, themes, 
Um, pretty much any war film uh, is going to have some Iliadic themes. Um, I suggest that um, a number of the Westerns that have been made, some of the marquee Westerns that were made in the mid-century, um, uh, John Ford's films, especially like The Searchers, um, many of these films uh, also evoke um, evoke Iliadic themes uh, in different historical contexts, right? Uh, in the Western context, in the context of World War II, the Vietnam War, uh, et cetera. So uh, a lot has been written about Iliadic themes in uh, war films. So moving along, I know I'm kind of now I'm trying to hurry up. Uh, I'm gonna just skip Blade Runner um, and go right to the adaptations of Homer's Odyssey. Now, when we look at um, this one, um, uh, this one uh, mini series, as it was called back in the day, uh, that uh, um, that aired on uh, NBC on network TV back in 1997. Remember network TV? Um, the Odyssey um, mini series uh, uh, presents in two parts. It's about you know it's about two two hours and fifteen minutes long. Um, it presents a real time story, right? Those of us who have read the Odyssey, all of us here uh, know that a lot of the Odyssey is told in flashback, right? When Odysseus finally gets to a place of safety, several books of the Odyssey are told uh, in flashback as he's sitting at the dinner uh, table uh, among the Phaeacians and he tells his stories like, well, I guess I'm safe enough to tell my story and that's what he does. Well, you know, movies and TV uh, can't really do the flashback model because it's a little too slow or a little too uh, unexciting. And so they tell this as a real time story from beginning uh, to uh, end when Odysseus gets home. Some of the epic episodes from uh, the uh, Homeric poem are combined. Uh, but not too bad. Uh, They're pretty, uh, pretty well done in, as far as the epic episodes are, um, are told. Uh, the timeline is tweaked a little bit uh, in the sense that uh, Odysseus gets to hang out with a couple of the goddesses a little bit longer than he actually does in the Homeric poem. But again, romance is always highlighted and emphasized in uh, cinematic or televisual um, retellings. Um, but overall, I find this to be, um, and my students do too, and my colleagues do too, a pretty authentic um, a retelling, a uh, spectacular adaptation, as it says there on the, on the DVD poster, um, uh, pretty authentic to the epic uh, structure and storyline. Um, just like in the film uh, uh, Troy, where the character of Achilles is emphasized, um, here in the um, Hallmark miniseries uh, that uh, aired on NBC, which, uh, by the way, won several Emmys, so this is a pretty good, um, a pretty good uh, production. Um, the character of Odysseus is emphasized, right? He's smart and uh, tough and brave. Um, uh, we get his backstory all the way back um, to the, you know, to the Trojan uh, War and the Trojan Horse and so forth. Um, you know, but he's smart and sneaky and desperate to survive at all costs. Um, oops, I wanted to just highlight there, uh, Bernadette Peters, or Ar Armand Asante plays um, Odysseus. He mumbles quite a bit. It's kind of hard to follow his, uh, you have to turn up the volume uh, when you listen to this uh, miniseries. Um, but the goddess Circe, who you'll be talking about a little bit later this week, is played by um, the absolutely spectacular Bernadette Peters, the actress Bernadette Peters, in a, in a tour de force uh, performance as the goddess uh, Circe. So he has a lot of these... Um, a lot of these uh, encounters, right, um, uh, that are shown in the miniseries, um, which uh, uh, follow the episodic nature of the um, epic uh, itself in the narrative of the epic, um, and uh, he gets carried along um, uh, on his way home. But his character is definitely a focus of this um, miniseries. Um, but um, as befitting a sort of new kind of TV hero for the late 90s, um, we see that what is emphasized after all of these wonderful stops that he gets to do with these various goddesses on the way home, of course, his supreme goal is to get back to his son Telemachus, shown there uh, grown up, uh, and his wife uh, Penelope, uh, played by uh, um, the wonderful actress um, Greta Skaki there uh, down in the bottom corner there, you can see. So the... Um, 
the new kind of hero who, uh, you know, focus is less on the journey um, than it is on the homecoming. So again, that's my interpretation um, of the way this uh, mini series portrays the Odyssey. Um, you will have to make your own decision uh, if you were to watch it, but I think there, there is this emphasis on the homecoming part of it. Um, but the, there are several other themes uh, that are um, highlighted uh, in the uh, Odyssey miniseries as well. Uh, the Greek uh, word xenia, the theme of hospitality, um, uh, like in our words, xenophobia, right? Fear of strangers, xenia is a Greek word that means um, the bond that is shared between a guest uh, who comes to your house and the host uh, that extends this feeling of hospitality uh, to uh, the visitor. And so this is again, very uh, much emphasized in the uh, mini series as Odysseus, the character uh, travels from place to place. He relies on the kindness of strangers uh, to get home. Uh, some are more kind than others. If you see here in the, in the film still that I'm showing you here, this is the wonderful Vanessa Williams as the goddess Calypso um, uh, with this uh, wonderful uh, Greek island of hers, um, Ogygia, uh, uh, which has these great <laughs> uh, pools. I think this was shot actually on the coast of Turkey, somewhere where these uh, hot springs uh, are uh, there. So anyway, some of his uh, uh, hosts are a little bit kinder uh, than others. Um, but this, uh, this, this constant, you know, traveling from place to place and these stops that he makes um, to visit uh, Calypso and Circe and so forth, all of these are emphasized in the film uh, to, um, to uh, focus on the value of his own home uh, that he will eventually reach, his domos, uh, the value of his own home to get home to his wife and child and his desire to return home, which is another uh, emphasis in this um, miniseries, uh, this film, uh, which is his nostos, his desire to return home, like in our word nostalgia, which actually means pain, uh, longing to return home. And so that's also emphasized in this um, miniseries. All right. So uh, when he gets home, I just wanted to show you there are a couple of film stills. Uh, he is disguised as an old beggar, just like in the um, just like in the epic Odyssey. Uh, Penelope sets the contest of the bow. Uh, the beggar asks for a try and is revealed as Odysseus. Um, a couple of other Odyssey films, uh, uh, <laughs> films or a TV show. Um, of course, the famous Kirk Douglas. Um, uh, Odyssey uh, film uh, from 1954, uh, directed by uh, Mario uh, Camerini. Um, Jean-Luc Godard's, I just mentioned this here, his, his film, the film Contempt, kind of an interesting backstory, right? Because it focuses on the shooting of a film. It's very meta, you know, those French directors, right? Um, focuses on the shooting of an Odyssey film, right? And then the, the, the two actors, uh, the people involved in the film um, with uh, Brigitte Bardot and so forth. Um, uh, in their relationship is explored um, in that film. Um, and then uh, one of my favorite uh, episodes of the PBS uh, children's show uh, from the 1990s um, uh, called uh, Wishbone uh, is the Homer Sweet Homer uh, episode of Wishbone. If you ever uh, watched that when you were a kid or if you had kids, um, there's a great uh, episode of the Odyssey. Okay, I'm going to take up just a few more minutes uh, of your time. I hope that's okay with you, James, uh, just to highlight um, the, uh, the uh, film, uh, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Just because it is such a fabulous film. Um, let me just point out here um, a, a wonderful article uh, written by my car colleague, Margaret Toscano, um, about um, uh, the use of sort of the, the method uh, of, of pastiche uh, uh, used in the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, right? Uh, the Coen brothers famously said they had never read the Odyssey, which is, of course, just something that, you know, Odysseus himself would have loved to hear because it's such a, you know, it's such a fake, right? Um, it's obviously, you know, clearly based on the Odyssey with its episodic uh, nature, uh, uh, one um, episode uh, after uh, the other um, uh, in this uh, in this film. The um, uh, main character, the uh, hero of the film is Ulysses Everett McGill, right? Ulysses being the uh, 
Roman, uh, the Latin equivalent of the name Odysseus. Uh, many people don't really know exactly why the Romans called Odysseus Ulysses. Uh, there's some controversy about that, uh, but we knew we do know that they did. So the the main character is Ulysses Everett McGill, just like Odysseus. He's smart. He's fast talking. He's resourceful. He's very vain about his hair. Right, the one thing he can control in his life um, is the shape of his hair. And of course, uh, I'm a big fan uh, of George Clooney. My students always tease me about this. So um, um, yes, starring America's uh, finest actor, George Clooney again at the height of his powers uh, as an actor in the year 2000, um, about 20 years ago. He is also uh, a man uh, who uses uh, disguise uh, to achieve his homecoming. You see him there disguised as um, uh, one of the singers in a band. Um, he is referred to as a man of constant sorrow. There is a song in the, in the film which uses a lot of music uh, in it uh, to talk about um, uh, his uh, suffering that he experiences all through his travels uh, before he gets home. Uh, um, the music is a very important um, uh, element uh, of, uh, of the film. Uh, he must suffer before he gets home. He must uh, learn endurance. He must use his smarts. He uses uh, the, the theme of disguise, just like uh, Odysseus in the epic. Um, and he is <laughs> a man of much travels, many turns. He is polytropos, um, as uh, um, Odysseus is himself uh, in the film. Um, each uh, episode in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, um, is used to progressively reveal the main theme of the homecoming of the, of the character, uh, especially uh, um, uh, Ulysses Everett McGill. Uh, uh, that's one of his uh, friends there traveling with him um, in the sort of lotus eater scene, this um, uh, baptism uh, uh, on the riverbanks uh, in uh, the Tennessee River Valley. Um, uh, uh, shown to reveal uh, each episode, revealing the main theme of his desire to reach home. Um, there is a, a little bit of a, uh, an awkward uh, scene to teach now, uh, and that is the clan rally scene in this film, uh, where I used to teach it uh, to evoke the Greek mythological underworld and the visit of Odysseus uh, to the underworld. And I could talk about this element as a shameful element of, Americans, uh, of America's historical past. Um, of course, uh, now, you know, with more recent events in Charlottesville, uh, with the, the, the right wing rallies and so forth, um, you know, it's something that we have to talk about as something being more present in our in our current uh, politics and not something just um, in history. Uh, the scene also evokes other cinematic um, uh, uh, scenes uh, like from The Wizard of Oz, from The Lord of the Rings, uh, with the, you know, with the, uh, the characters in, in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou sort of peeking in and watching this unfold like in uh, Wizard of Oz and Lord of the Rings. So sorry, I'm going so fast here, but I forgot. So the episodic plot aims uh, for the homecoming so that Everett can be reunited with his wife, Penny, right? Uh, as with Penelope, uh, um, uh, Holly Hunter plays uh, his wife, uh, Penny, uh, Penelope, and he is uh, then rejoined with her. There's several mystical elements in the film as well, um, uh, showing us that uh, the journey is uh, just as important as the homecoming. Uh, there is a, a, a blind bard uh, who uh, tells the story for us from his uh, railroad cart. There's many of these sort of sepia tone kind of mystical fields of wheat, which of course always indicate, uh, you know, the journey um, to other worlds um, in these cinematic evocations. So just a couple of other um, films that might evoke uh, the sort of uh, um, more subterranean uh, references to the Odyssey uh, with more modern settings the, the um, older film, Mervyn Leroy's uh, Homecoming from 1948, um, Yuli's Gold uh, from uh, 1997, and Anthony Minghella's, if you haven't seen this movie, Cold Mountain, it's a very, um, very much uh, based on the Odyssey um, uh, with Jude Law and uh, Nicole Kidman and um, uh, um, also an Oscar winning uh, film. Uh, so um, anyway, so let's see, I am... Uh, was going to mention Mad Max, and I was also going to mention, um, was also going to mention Troy Fall of a City, but I think I better stop here unless, oops, 
unless uh, James says I can go a little further, but I think I'll just stop here uh, and let you guys ask some questions because I've already gone five minutes over my time. <laughs> No, you're you're still good. You've you've got you've got a little more time if you want to uh, talk about one of these. Uh, I'm certainly very interested. In, oh, okay. So let me just mention yeah. um, this uh, the the TV show, right? Okay. Let me just go ahead and take five minutes to talk about um, my new uh, passion, uh, which is the Netflix series that came out just before. Well, not just before, but a little bit before uh, COVID. But you can still go back um, and um, and take a look at it. Um, the film, uh, the, the, the series is an eight part series and each, uh, each episode starts with this title card that says inspired by Homer and the Greek myths, right? Um, so it tells in eight hours, right? Because it's eight episodes. It tells um, uh, the, the backstory. There's about four episodes before they even get to Troy. So how Paris and Helen met, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it goes all the way to, you know, sorry, spoiler alert, Troy, fall of a city. It's right in the title. It goes to the very end of, um, of the, the, the Trojan War. There were a lot of criticisms of this, uh, of this uh, series. You can see here, I, I pulled a couple of, of the tweets out. Um, uh, but I think upon rewatching now, people can tell that um, it actually had a lot of value. And I'm hopeful that they will do a... Um, they will do a uh, sequel uh, with the Odyssey, we shall see. So as James mentioned, um, my uh, latest book co-edited with my colleague, Anthony Agustakis, um, that came out from Bloomsbury recently, uh, just this year. Um, another book uh, recommendation for you, if you would like to take a look at that. Um, but let me just mention really quickly that one of the things that this, uh, this uh, series does uh, so well is that it brings back the Greek gods, all right? So something that uh, in Peterson's film, uh, Troy from 2004, the Greek gods were banished. Uh, we had Julie Christie playing Thetis, the mother of Achilles, but that was the only um, uh, divinity that we saw in that film. Um, but the, um, the Greek gods are very well represented and goddesses um, in the um, in the Netflix series Troy Fall of a City, um, uh, as you may know, the the, the series was um, sort of uh, there was a lot of backlash about um, uh, the racially diverse casting uh, in this uh, in this show. We have a couple of articles about that, a couple of chapters in our book about the backlash uh, that um, the producers received, uh, even death threats from crazy you know white supremacists. You know, Zeus can't be uh, black, Achilles can't be black, that kind of thing. So uh, very interesting, you know, how that all happened um, in 2018, uh, when now, you, you know, there's so many shows, you know, Bridgerton, you know, the all kinds of different shows on television now with um, racially diverse casting and, you know, um, still some backlash, but this was one of the first series uh, to do that. So that brings back um, the gods. Um, we see in the first episode um, the very famous um, uh, judgment of, of Paris scene uh, with uh, Hermes uh, 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 bringing uh, the golden apple uh, to um, uh, Paris, uh, who is asked to decide. Um, uh, and Aphrodite, uh, played by Lex King, a South African actress, uh, every day is a good hair day when you're Aphrodite. Uh, she, of course, gets Paris uh, to choose her, um, and um, the uh, golden burning apple is pulled out of the fire. Uh, Paris chooses Aphrodite, um, and Zeus says the mortal has spoken. Hakim Kai Kazim, um, I just saw him. He's also in the new Stars series, uh, the new remake of Dangerous Liaisons. He's also in that as well. It's great to see these actors uh, getting more work. Um, there is an exquisite scene in episode two, and I have a bunch of these gifts or however you pronounce that, uh, which recreates the catalog of troops scene from book two in the Iliad, um, where the goddesses, the actresses playing the goddesses walk through the troops, uh, calling out to their various champions on both the Trojan side and the Greek side, um, saying, I bless you, Hector, I bless you, Achilles, and so forth. It's absolutely Absolutely cool, you guys. Um, if you if you want to watch, if you want to just pick and choose, uh, take a look at episode two with this wonderful uh, recreation of the catalog uh, of troops. 
Um, there's this, uh, here's a couple of the warriors coming through um, with the goddesses calling out their names, um, uh, just like in the catalog of troops. Uh, one of the most boring passages in Homer's Iliad, uh, just brilliantly, dramatically brought to life um, in episode two here, uh, as the goddesses walk through the troops uh, in these weird outfits, but, uh, and again, I'm not a costume designer, so. Um, and then there's this wonderful long shot as Aphrodite runs between the two, um, the two, uh, the two armies as they clash together, uh, showing that it is Aphrodite, in fact, who was the cause of the war in bringing Paris and Helen together, this great love affair. And then she runs right through the troops in this uh, sequence. It's pretty cool. And it shows you just what, uh, what was missing, I think, from the movie Troy, uh, that they didn't have um, the Greek gods. A um, couple more highlights I just wanted to show you. Um, they do show in episode four, uh, the fight between uh, Paris and uh, Menelaus, uh, what's called the Monomachia from book three in Homer, Homer's Iliad, again, with Aphrodite um, overseeing it. Uh, she doesn't quite save uh, Paris physically, but she does get him out of this uh, trap. I'll let you watch the, um, watch the episode for yourself. Uh, she appears uh, as sort of a dream to him, and she yells at him, run. Uh, I think of that scene in, in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, where uh, uh, one of the kids runs away from the fire saying he's going to R-U-N-N-O-F-T. Uh, that's just a little funny thing there for you. Um, let me see if I have another sequence to show you. Yes, in episode seven, um, we have, again, I just love the uh, portrayal of the gods in this, um, in this uh, series. Um, as we see that, the, that Troy is going to fall, Zeus does not intervene. Uh, Aphrodite wants to save uh, her son Aeneas. Uh, Athena wants to save her champions, um, but uh, Zeus tells them don't intervene. We have to let uh, fate uh, take its uh, toll. Um, uh, just some other characters, um, uh, Achilles and Hector down in the bottom there, the, the killing of Hector, probably one of the most brutal recreations of the death of Hector that I have ever seen on screen. Um, in the upper corner there, we do have the character of he Hecuba, who does not even uh, occur in the Troy film. So that's kind of, uh, kind of an interesting thing. All the female characters are well represented and not composite um, in, this, uh, in this series. Um, so let me just get to the very end. Let's get to the very end here. And this is the, the very last episode showing the Trojan horse, um, which my students called the death pinata, which I thought was kind of funny. So I'll put that there just to lighten the, uh, lighten the, uh, the mood of the fall of the city, um, uh, where, uh, Helen argues, uh, that she is not a possession to be sent back, uh, to, uh, uh the Greeks. Um, and uh, Aeneas uh, there, uh, as you see in the bottom there, uh, uh, the, the lone survivor after the fall of Troy, uh, which is shown um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sequence. Um, we see Helen then carted back to the ships. Uh, the goddesses appear at the very end in, in Troy, uh, Aphrodite weeping over the death of, of her favorites. Uh, Athena and Hera then standing there with no real uh, reconciliation and Aeneas uh, rising from the ashes as the sole survivor at the end. So uh, yeah, so that was a very quick run through of, uh, the, um, of the Troy fall of a city, but I will take questions now. So I did that in eight minutes, uh, James, how's that? That was a little bit too much, but hopefully. It was impressive, a lot okay. to get through. <laughs> yeah. A lot so to get through. Um, so yeah, um, if anyone had any questions throughout the, uh, the presentation, you know, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, and uh, we've got uh, we've got a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes or so, that we can just take some questions and um, answer them. Will they go to you and you'll tell me? They'll go to me. Okay. Uh, you'll be able to see them, but I'll just read them out. Too. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, no, it's, tru it's really fascinating. Uh, you really do like to see these kinds of, um, to how the myths kind of go forward these poems and these these epic tales and they kind of uh turn into other things and they inspire other stories it's a really fascinating uh 
Well, subject. well, one thing that's really interesting for, for me, I've done a lot of work on Roman stuff, okay? So the Roman stuff is pretty straightforward because it's always Roman history, right? So you've got Caesar and Cleopatra, you've got, you know, there's that German series on Netflix now called the, the Barbaran. It's really good. It's about the Roman army. You know, the, the movies and TV shows love to do Roman, right? They do Roman history, Roman army, you know, lots of cool costumes and stuff like that. But when you get to the Greek material, it's very different because you're looking at you're looking at these epics you know there's gods how do you deal with the gods right you're looking at greek mythology greek history is not that is not as interesting right you've got the alexander stuff and those movies haven't done very well um you know the spartans you know that stuff does well sometimes but the vast majority of the greek stuff is mythological or literary right so how do you how do you do that how do you do it well how do you do it interestingly so you know that's why i was trying to sort between the the properties that you know the productions that show the ancient world like the troy fall of a city or the troy movie and then those that sort of use the plots and themes like oh brother where art thou so you know there's there's a, a split level kind of model when you look at the greek material that with the roman material is 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 just not there because there's not really a lot of roman uh, literary or mythological material that's put on screen in fact like nearly zero so interesting uh, we had anyway. someone just comment saying that uh, thank you so much for the great lecture. Um, so we got thank some. you. You're welcome. Anytime. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, you know, shoot me an email. Anybody who has a follow up question, especially if you do think of it later, um, you can find me very easily uh, through the Google. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, okay. Let me just open the chat to see if maybe there's something in the chat that I'm missing. Doesn't look like it. Uh, we might might have no questions. Oh, uh, well, tonight. I covered it so thoroughly that- <laughs> A, a no comprehensive questions. lecture. Comprehensively, uh, yes. Which uh, we're very thankful for. Um, uh, again, you know, thank you, Professor. Uh, this was um, just an incredible lecture, uh, a lot of material to cover, um, but uh, the lecture will be recorded. It will be going up on our, uh, on our uh, the library's YouTube page um, in I think a week or two, maybe, and maybe, maybe sooner. Um, but so if you feel like you didn't get it, get a, um, feel like you missed something or if you feel like it went a little too fast, you can always go back there and then rewatch it. Um, so thank you, everyone. And thank you, Professor. Um, I hope everyone has a, a great night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care.